So we're going to talk about, uh, do, get some insight into the four biggest companies and then try and predict who will be number five. Who, who has the opportunity to join the ranks of the most powerful and meaningful companies in the world? About $10 million in market cap among these, uh, per employee among these four companies compared to the, any, any sovereign that blows away any GDP per capita. Uh, if you were to express this geographically or demographically, imagine the population of Lexington, Kentucky with the GDP of Australia. That is literally the outsized creation of wealth we have among these, among these four firms. And if you talk about return on human capital, you see that the valuation relative to their peers among these four firms is incredibly dramatic. Facebook needs uh, six people, Google eight, to do 10 million in revenue. WPP, Omnicom, and Publicis need more like 60. Amazon needs 17 people. Macy's, Nordstrom's, and Sears need around 50 or 60. People think of these companies as job creators. They're actually job destroyers. They're not doing anything evil, but they just do more with less. Specifically, they do a lot more revenue with a lot fewer people. I think this is the scariest slide in corporate America. This is, we went on LinkedIn, and we tried to pattern and scrape LinkedIn, where people worked and the migration patterns, where are people leaving and going to. This is the number of people who have gone from P&G, L'Oreal, Unilever, and Estee Lauder to Google, Facebook, and Amazon. So this is the number of people who have left those organizations to go to a high-tech company. This is the number of people who have con gone from Google, Facebook, and Amazon to these organizations. So if you want to find the most talented people at P&G, L'Oreal, Unilever, and Estee Lauder, it's easy. Just go to Google. <laughs> it's not all roses, though. These companies have some of the worst retention. Um, of the Fortune 500, these companies have the highest, uh, two of the top five, Google and Amazon, have the highest, um, some of the highest churn rates. And at the bottom, you have Procter & Gamble, which has some of the highest retention of any company in the Fortune 500. They all started out in separate places. Now they're all obviously competing against one, each, uh, against one another. They're trying to all become your global operating system hub or gosh. So Amazon, I would describe as starting out as the marketplace. I think of Google as the closest thing to God in the sense that when we pray, we have questions. We send something in, into the universe hoping for information back. Is my kid going to be OK? Now we type in symptoms and treatment of croup into Google. Apple is enlightenment around things like design and brand, and Facebook is about relationships. So these, things, these companies tap into very basic instincts and have garnered tremendous resonance in terms of their market cap and their stock appreciation over the last three years. So who would be the fifth horseman? Who could be a trillion dollars? What's the T algorithm? We sussed out eight dimensions that make a company as powerful as some of these four. four. A distinct product, a truly differentiated product, not a better product, but a truly differentiated product with a lot of intellectual property around it. Visionary capital, meaning the CEO has outlined such an incredible vision that they're rewarded with exceptionally cheap access to capital. They are global, and typically what we mean by global is the presence in the US, European, and Chinese market being the second largest economy in the world. They're great places to work and almost have a maternal feel to them. That human capital flows to these organizations because they have a great reputation for taking care of their employees. They have control of their distribution, they're vertical. Over 50% of luxury goods are now sold through vertical channels. All of the four horsemen have a lot of control further and further downstream. They're tracking data to specific identities. They have fantastic brands. We call this vanity. That gives people self-expressive benefit where the consumer feels better about themselves associating with these brands. And they're technically literate, usually because they're within a bike ride of a world-class engineering university. So let's look at Alibaba.com and let's try and figure out Alibaba's algorithm and talk a little bit about Alibaba. 60% of all packages in China originate from Alibaba. Some incredible innovation in the US to try and mirror e-commerce here and then offer it to a larger Chinese market using Alibaba's infrastructure. A third of a billion annual active buyers, sells in 190 countries. We talk about Black Friday, Singles Day in China on Alibaba generated nine billion in sales versus three billion of all sales on Black Friday. So if you were to look at the algorithm, you would say, okay, Alibaba has most of it. What are its weak points? Its jury is still out on whether it can do, have a big business in the US and Europe. And also, you wouldn't describe Alibaba yet as an aspirational brand that people really want to associate with. Let's talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a more robust business than any other social media platform in the sense that its revenue is more diversified. 90% plus of all revenue on social media platforms comes from one revenue source, and that's advertising. 
but on LinkedIn, it comes from three different sources, basically advertisers, users, and then recruiters. So it's got a nice diversification that the others don't enjoy. We would argue it has the biggest moat around its business because you may, you may cheat, if you will, or you may be tempted by another social media platform on the consumer side. On the professional side, it's really LinkedIn and the Seven Dwarves. There really isn't anybody else who you're going to go fill out your resume on. LinkedIn really does have a bigger moat around its business than any other social media platform. More users than Twitter. In 200 plus countries, who's on LinkedIn? Pretty much anybody who matters. And if you look at the percentage of people graduating from college, almost all of them are now filling out their profiles on LinkedIn. So what would be LinkedIn's weakness? LinkedIn really hasn't established an aspirational brand yet, and they could probably get there through different forms of badging, but LinkedIn to date hasn't been able to establish the same type of self-expressive benefit when you associate or attain a certain level on LinkedIn. Nike, could Nike be the next trillion dollar company? It is the preferred brand among upper income teens. This is the most attractive demographic in the world. It's the future of wealth, the most influential people in the world. Hands down, Nike is the number one brand. There's a tectonic shift taking place in apparel, the second larger consumer category in the world, and that is essentially people are moving from denim to sweatpants. And it sounds, it sounds minor, but it's a huge trend in a gigantic industry. And as you can see, athletic wear has now taken over denim for the first time. And who's at the top of the list? Nike by threefold over any other brand that's in the way of this unbelievable shift in in consumer preferences. So where does Nike fall short? They really don't have true product differentiation the way some of these tech companies do, and that there's no real IP around a lot, most of their product, and they'd have to come up with something that's probably somehow rooted in technology that would be more defensible. They don't have the type of visionary capital. In other words, their stock trades at a great multiple, but not at the same multiple of an Amazon or some of these other tech companies, so they don't have access to the same type of capital to do crazy, make crazy experiments. And our prediction is they're going to have to get into the business in a much bigger way of retail. They only control about 10 or 15% of their existing distribution right now, and you can't maintain an aspirational positioning unless you control more of your, more of your distribution. And we believe that to be serious and head towards a trillion dollar market cap, they're going to have to establish a significant presence in a city outside of Portland where they'd have access to world-class engineering talent. Starbucks, we believe, could be the fifth horseman. An unbelievable increase in stock market capitalization, a global company. There's been two stores a day, two Starbucks stores a day built every day for the last 27 years to give you a sense of the scale there. People, uh, teens are now spending more money on food than they are on clothes, so there's been a dramatic shift in consumer behavior that rewards Starbucks. Starbucks is a tech company that happens to serve hot beverages. People don't, they don't get enough respect. 16% of their payments are done through their mobile app. About a third of a billion people are using the Starbucks mobile payment app. They're now getting into ordering and home delivery. They are fantastic to their employees. You can go to college and get paid for it. Starbucks spends more money on employee benefits than they spend on coffee beans. And as a result, they're able to attract fantastic human capital. The opportunity here and the problem is they only get about nine bucks per order, but that's the opportunity. If Starbucks goes to 30 or 40 bucks, you're looking at a company that'll probably be half a trillion dollars in market cap. So where do they shape up? What do they need in terms of the algorithm, the T algorithm, to get to a trillion dollars? They, need, they too need, probably need a product with more IP, and they're on their way developing technology-centered products that are more defensible, and also a bigger vision that gives them access to uh, cheap capital and obviously progress against that vision so they can get cheaper capital. Tesla. Why do people drive Tesla? Not because they're environmentally conscious, but because they want a humble brag way of saying that they drive a $140,000 car. Tesla is a fantastic self-expressive benefit brand. It serves a lot of vanity metrics. It's one of the best new luxury brands to come on the market in the last 10 years. Uh, it is a differentiated product. The performance here is unparalleled. They have established a, a, defen a defensible, differentiated product. They have access to cheap capital. This is a multiple of revenues that their stock market valuation has relative to other auto companies. As you can see, they have license to do a lot of crazy things that other automobile manufacturers could never dream of. Uh, they are changing the game in terms of retail, putting auto dealerships in malls and controlling their distribution and getting into a power wall. They're basically trying to do the same thing to power that Netflix and Amazon and Chromecast have done to cable, and they've said that linear power makes no sense, and we want to have on-demand, over-the-top power where it's more portable. Also, one of the key attributes here that I think Elon Musk shares with Steve Jobs or anyone who's had a huge impact on the world is that he's just a little bit crazy. I mean, look at what Tesla's in. They're in power, they're in cars, and they're in space, right? 
I can't imagine that they don't get more resumes from five-year-old boys than anybody else. Who wouldn't want to work at Tesla? What's getting in the way of them becoming a trillion-dollar company? They aren't really a global company yet. They've had trouble selling their automobiles in China, and also they haven't had the same scope of being able to attach identities to specific products and specific actions, and that gets in the way of their progress. We don't think they have the same power in the marketplace because they have a much more limited, finite set of users because of their product. Let's talk about Uber. There are a million people taking Uber every day. That's more people than take the L line or the T in Chicago and Boston. The MTA is at about 5 million. If you look at the number of people working for Uber right now, 162,000, it's approaching what General Motors has. It's double delta. It's almost triple with the MTA. Is. Think about the capital infrastructure and the decades it took to build these organizations versus Uber. Uber has the credibility and license with us now to get into a lot of different categories. This is actually a, a, a video animation of cars at carpooling.com, but I think the same would be true, only more viscosity for Uber. Uber has effectively become the vascular system for business, delivering atoms, or think of it this way, it's the broadband pipe for atoms. The driving dead. Taxis are already extinct. They just don't know it yet. This is 2014, the ratio of people taking Uber versus taxis. Watch what happens there. This is just one year ago. One year later, it's almost even in some of the biggest cities in America. Take a taxi while you're here just for nostalgia's sake. It is going away. <laughs> you can take an Uber for 90 cents a mile in Chicago. Now, what could you do with a very smart automobile with a smart person inside that doesn't belong to a union, doesn't have a uniform, doesn't have health insurance, and doesn't have the ability to strike? You can do a lot with those people. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but we have the cheapest source of real-time on-demand labor in the history, investing in their own capital expenditure acquiring their own capex in the form of Uber. This is an unbelievably robust vascular system for global business. They're using that infrastructure around the world, getting into all sorts of new businesses. The thing that's going to get in the way here is a big question around whether Uber is good for society, because whether or not their employees are treated well, and if this is a good thing for labor and for the people who work for Uber. Walmart. Incredible uh, growth company, 30% growth, or their e-commerce, incredible growth. They're, they grew their e-commerce sales faster than Amazon grew its sales, opening 117 stores in China. Uh, it's an unbelievable scale. This is a company that has more revenue than any other company in the world, and obviously that has tremendous benefits. Very savvy in terms of making an incredible investment, recognizing that Arkansas was not a hotbed of innovation around technology, has built a very large technology group in uh, uh, San Bruno. Somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 people are now working in San Francisco trying to figure out e-commerce, tapping into this click and collect phenomena. 50% of online orders uh, at walmart.com are now picked up at a store. That's something Amazon cannot replicate. The future looks more like Sephora, Williams, Sonoma, Macy's, and Walmart than it does like Amazon. Consumers don't want monochannel, they want multi-channel. Big problem here, the Waltons uh, are now wealthier than 40%, the bottom 40% of America. If a revolution starts in America, my guess is it's going to start in aisle five of a Walmart. <laughs> So there's a lot of issues here. Walmart isn't really a self-expressive benefit brand. It's some identity, not a lot. Obviously not a very maternal company in terms of some of their label I issues. Not as successful as you would think globally. It's difficult for a low-end or a medium-end brand to go global because middle-class consumers have different criteria around the world in terms of where they want to shop. They have an unbelievable, unbelievable cash flow and revenue, but you wouldn't argue that they have cheap capital. And their product is a fantastic product, but we, you wouldn't argue it has the same sort of intellectual property defensibility that some of these tech companies have. So what is the algorithm looking at a, weight, a weighted adjusted level based on those, those, those criteria that we put up? This is the ranking in descending order. And whenever we do one of these speeches, we get calls from hedge funds that say, we're buying or shorting, we saw your we saw your uh, talk, and I just want to remind everybody, and I want to finish where I started. I get this wrong all the time. <laughs> My name is Scott Galloway. I teach at NYU, and I appreciate your time.